Good evening, class. I hope you're having a blessed day. I hope you are ready for this lesson today. We are in topic number 16. We are going to be dealing with kingdom finance. Now, kingdom finance is one of my favorite lessons. I think I say that every week, but I really do like this lesson because it gives you some understandings that you may or may not have ever thought about. There's probably some things in here that you haven't actually read through or maybe you didn't know about when it comes to finance, doing it God's way, doing it the kingdom way. Because the only way to really do things God's way is to know what God says about things. So this lesson is not going to be just promises dealing with God sustaining you, but also how do we cooperate? How do we participate and what does God think about finances? So we're going to talk about this today for a little while. It's definitely going to be a fun lesson. And what we're going to do is we're going to just pray and we're going to jump right into it so we can try to fit it all in. We do have some additional resources already on the website. We're going to be adding some more to that today. So it should be uh, updated for you later this afternoon. And then also... If you have any questions, please send your questions in. We'll be more than happy to answer those. But let me pray and let's just jump right into this lesson today. So, Father, I thank you. I pray you bless everybody under the sound of my voice. Let the word become wisdom revelation in the knowledge of your son. Spiritual seed sown, producing in our body, mind, will, and emotion. Transforming us by the renewing of our mind. Conforming us to the image of Christ. Growing us up in the measure and the stature of the fullness of Christ. God, we love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's do this. Let's jump right here into Ephesians 1. This is something that I was praying about actually recently in the past week about how I how I personally pray. And one of the things that I always pray is I always say, Father, bless everybody under the sound of my voice. And there's a truth that undergirds this that I want to tell you because everything that I pray when I pray before a, 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 a discipleship class or before a Sunday sermon or before a daily teaching it's all undergirded in different Bible verses. So this is one of those verses. It says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus, to the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. What blessings do you have from God? All spiritual blessings in heavenly places. These things have already been given. This is something that I want you to know when it says, hath blessed. It's already done. God doesn't need to bless you again because you are already blessed. So when I pray and I say, Father, bless everybody under the sound of my voice, it is actually a declared confession over you. I'm not asking God to re-bless you. I'm just praying for the blessing over your life to come into manifestation. Because I'm agreeing with what God said. God said he blessed you, so I agree. God blessed you in Jesus' name. Just something that's been on my heart recently, which is important when we start about kingdom finance. Because the things you need to know about this is that it has already been done. Let me read this. We'll go to 2 Peter. We're going to add in an additional verse real fast. Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be the partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And beside this, giving all diligence, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, virtue, knowledge, and knowledge, temperance, and to temperance, patience, and to patience, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that hath but he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and has forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Now, this is an important passage 
Because when you compare Second Peter and Ephesians 1 together, what you see is that God has already given you all spiritual blessings, exceeding great and precious promises, and everything that pertains unto life and godliness, grace and peace, all of these things have already been given unto you. This is where we need to start when we start about our lesson on kingdom finance, is the fact that we are not looking for God to do something. We are looking to receive what God has already given. Because He has already given us all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. He's already given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. Exceeding great and precious promises. Everything that you need has already been given. But Second Peter is important because it says it's through the knowledge of it's through our understanding of the Word of God so we can pray effectively. We can sow and reap effectively. And that's what we're going to be looking at today. When it comes to kingdom finance, when it talks about receiving from God financially, we have to cooperate and participate in how God wants it done. God set it up in a way for you to receive financial provision from Him. And the way we receive is the way we participate. And this is what we're going to be looking at today. We're going to be looking at some truths dealing with money. We're going to look at some things that we need just to know ahead of time. And then we're going to look at how do we participate with God in our finances. So let's go to the next one. Now thanks be unto God, which, cause, which always causes us to triumph in Christ and maketh manifest the Savior of His knowledge by us in every place. It's always, how often do you triumph? You triumph always, always causes us to triumph. You're never the loser. You are always the victor. You always triumph. And you always triumph because it is the Savior. And this word Savior is not talking about like your Savior Jesus Christ is one that one that redeemed you to God, but Savior as in the fragrance or the way people see Him. The way they see God is beautiful. The way they see God as the provider, as Jehovah Jireh. The way other people see Him as your provider in every place you go is what God is causing you to triumph so His name can go forth. So God wants you prosperous. So many people think that, oh, if I am, you know, God wants me in lack and he wants me to suffer. Like these, these things are not true. Now there is a grace out there for going through seasons of life where you might, it might seem like you were in lack. You might be losing financial promotion from the world because you serve God. It's called persecution. Now that has an eternal reward that God will repay because you, you will receive abundance in the, in the, in the age to come. But I want to tell you that God will never let you beg bread. I hope that's in this lesson. If it's not, we're going to add it into the additional resources. But it is in, uh, I believe it's in Psalm 37. Hold on, let me write it down. Never seen the righteous. But David said, I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. So I want to tell you that God will never let you beg bread. But I want to tell you that the reason why you are prosperous is not for your own exaltation to lift yourself up in pride. The reason which God causes you to triumph is so that God's name can go forth in all the earth, showing he is faithful to his word to take care of his people. This is an important thing. For promotion cometh neither from the east, nor from the west, nor from the south, but God is the judge. He put it down one and set it up another. Now, where does promotion come from? Promotion comes from God. Listen, promotion does not come from your boss. Promotion does not come from your supervisor. Promotion does not come from the CEO of your company. Promotion comes from God. This is an important thing to know. Let's answer the next question. I'll tell you why. Why is it important to know? Well, let's answer the question. When you know that promotion is from God, you work as God is your boss who will give a promotion. Your employer does not promote you. 
These are important points that we really need to hold on to because there are people that work as if their boss is the one that promotes them. And when they work like that, they base their effort and what they do in their job based on whether their boss likes them or not, treats them fairly or not, compensates them or not, promotes them or not. I've seen many believers, even to this day, that when they go into their job, if their boss isn't treating them right, they do a subpar, they do subpar work. Or they, or they don't put all the effort in. They don't go all the way. They start doing things halfway. Well, you don't like me. and You don't do these things for me. So this is how I'm going to treat you. And they base it off the actions of their boss. Well, let me tell you, if you are born again, that is not how God has called you to work. And the first principle you need to know is that this promotion comes from God. Your employer is not the one that is bringing forth promotion in your life. So let's read this next verse. This next verse is one of my favorites. Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling and singleness of your heart as unto Christ, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. So let's look at this verse a little bit. Well, let's, let's, let's read the first question. How are we supposed to serve? And when we talk about service, we're also talking about your job. You know, back in those days when we talk about service, you can apply it today as in your job, whatever your occupation is. You work in the school system, you work in the marketplace, you work in construction, you work in the healthcare world, whatever you do, your occupation. How are we supposed to serve? How are we supposed to work? unto the Lord with good will doing service. We're supposed to do it with good will. We're supposed to do it with the right attitude, with the right heart position, not with eye service as men pleasers. Now, what does it mean when it says eye service as men pleasers? Well, I'm going to give you a picture that should explain it really well. You're in a building and there's a bunch of cubicles and your boss is on this side and you're on this side. Well, as long as your boss is over here and you're over here, you don't have to do no work if you don't really want to. You can sit there and play on your phone. But you see your boss coming around the cubicles, you start to work. So you are only you are only serving when somebody is seeing so you can please men. There's a lot of people that do that. They only work if their boss is looking at them. It's with eye service. I, I, I serve when you see me. And, and it's because I'm trying to please you. Because as soon as you leave, I don't work like that anymore. And the Bible, I mean, Paul's very clear to the Ephesians church, and this applies directly to anybody that is a believer. Not with eye service as men pleasers. You are not supposed to work that way. Because whether your boss is standing right beside you or your boss is on a business trip across the country, God sees you. And your promotion comes from God. So when we know that I am promoted because of what God sees and what God does. Then I work as unto God. I show up to work early, not even just on time, but I go to work early. You know, if I need to stay a little bit late, that's okay. I do all of my work on time and effectively. I do it right. I do it correctly. I don't waste my company's time. You might say, well, Cody, that's, that just seems like a lot. Well, you don't have to receive promotion if you don't want to. You can work as a men pleaser with eye service and you'll never receive because you won't be doing it God's way. God says you work as God is your boss, not as your boss is your boss. Because if you are a believer, that man is not your boss. It is God. How does this apply to our jobs? Work as if God is your boss. That's the, that's the simplest way I can tell you how to do this. Work as if God is your boss. You work hard whether anybody is watching or acknowledging or not. Because we know God is watching and He is who promotion comes from. That's why we work the way we do. That's why we do what we do. I want to tell you right now, I, I, I've, I've seen testimonies of this many times. Where people... You know, they will work and they will be mistreated at their job. 
maybe their boss is mistreating them with all this extra work that they shouldn't have to do or hours or whatever, whatever, whatever. And there are people that get offended and they get upset and they work as men pleasers of the ISR and they never receive the promotion they're looking for. But then I know people that serve as unto God. They do it like God is their boss. And the next thing you know, not only did their boss not have a job anymore, because they'll end up getting fired or something, but they don't just receive one promotion. They'll run all the way up the ladder and eventually they'll be CEO of the company because of how great of a job they do. Uh, when I was growing up, my, my parents used to say, you know, you never know who's watching. Well, let me say this. God is always watching. And what you do when you are doing it as unto the Lord will never be forgotten. God will always repay that. And you might say, well, Cody, I thought this lesson was on finance. It is. This You, you, you want to increase in finance? You got to move up in your job. You got to grow in what you're doing. And the way that that happens in your life is by you working as unto the Lord. You can't do it with men pleasers or with eye service as a man pleaser. If you're doing that, I uh, implore you to stop that today and work as unto God. No matter what your boss, your employer, no matter what they say, do the best job you can, as hard as you can, and do it like you're working for God and watch God promote. Next passage. Now when they were come to Capernaum, they that received tribute money came to Peter and said, Doth your master pay tribute? He saith, Yes. And he was coming to the house. Jesus prevented him, saying, What thinkest thou, Simon? Of whom do the kings of the earth take custom or tribute? Of their own children or of strangers? Peter saith of him, of strangers. Jesus saith unto him, Then the children are free. Notwithstanding, lest we should offend them, go thou to the sea, and cast an hook, and take up the fish that first cometh up. And when thou hast opened his mouth, thou shalt find a piece of money. That take and give unto them for me and thee. Now what did Jesus Tell Peter to do, and what happened? Pay tribute to the king, the taxes. That's what he's talking about. We're talking about taxes. Pay the taxes. And Jesus, what happened? Jesus, he went to the sea. The first fish will have money in it. Listen, God will supernaturally provide for you when it is needed. They needed to pay something. They didn't have it. Boom, supernatural sustainment. If you take our divine purpose curriculum, we have a whole lesson on supernatural sustainment. Let me tell you, God will sustain you. He will take care of you. But let me just go ahead and uh, say, well, let's let's do this. What What is the principle Jesus was teaching here? All of these apply to your finances and kingdom finance. Listen, money is an earthly system. Money is not a kingdom system. It is an earthly system. When you live by the Spirit, even the animals will bring you money if you need it. When you live by the Spirit, when you walk with God, when you are doing what God told you, God will bring forth sustainment in ways you have never known before. I mean, Elijah had ravens bring him food. We saw fish and bread multiply, Old and New Testament. We, and when God has done so many amazing things of sustainment. But if you're walking with him, if you're doing it of the heart position of doing what's right, Listen, if you're not doing what's right, I, you're going to be hard-pressed to ever receive from God, if ever. I'd, I'd be more likely to say you'll never receive from God if you're not doing what's right. So you want to always make sure you're doing what you're supposed to. Paying taxes honors authority that God put in place. Now let me say this, because there's some people that might disagree with what I'm about to say, and let me go ahead and tell you you're wrong. God promotes God places people in position. God allows people to go into positions. That person coming out of whatever position they are in is God's responsibility. It's God's responsibility to bring one up and set one or set one up and bring one down. That is God's role. Our role is to honor God, which means we are supposed to honor authority in the world that we live in and in our lives. So paying taxes honors God. You might not like it, you might not want to do it, but it honors God. So don't lie on your taxes. 
You make Christianity and you make Christians look bad when you lie on your taxes and you deceive and you sh and you cheat and you steal. It's that's stealing. The Bible says all people that steal go to hell. So don't do that. Listen, God wants you to be blessed. But when you do stuff like cheat on your taxes, which is stealing, and you lie and things like that, you allow a foothold for the devil to come in and destroy you. Don't do that. Don't do that. I'm not going to get fired up today. I'm, I'm trying to stay. I got a little fired up in our daily teaching this morning. If you hadn't seen it, you need to go watch it. It's on not being ignorant. So I, I recommend you watch that. But I just I want you to be blessed. And you need to know these principles about finances. You need to know that God already gave it to you. The promotion's from God. You need to work as God is your boss. You need to just pay your taxes. I remember Dr. Summerall used to say, just pay them. Whatever they say you owe, just pay it. Write the check, pay them, and be done with it. He said, then people will kill you. There's no sense in going through that. There's no sense in arguing with them. And in the church, I take this with all of my heart. I, when I was in the auto industry, I paid more taxes than anybody. One year, I wrote like almost a $40,000 check to pay taxes. Listen, is that was that awesome? Absolutely not. It was terrible. I didn't want to pay it at all. But we still paid it. I just paid it and moved on. It's not worth going through that. The things that the government can do to you is not worth it. So when taxes are owed, just pay them. And not only pay him to be done with it, but, but pay him because it honors God. Don't lie. Don't cheat. Don't steal. Don't do that stuff no more. Just don't do it. And the speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. And God said unto him, Because thou hast asked this thing, and hast not asked for thyself long life, neither hast thou asked riches for thyself, nor asked, hast asked the life of thine enemies, but hast asked for thyself understanding to discern judgment, behold, I have done according to thy words. Lo, I have given thee a wise and an understanding heart, so that there was none like thee before thee, neither after thee shall any arise like unto thee. And I have also given thee, which thou hast not asked, both riches and honor, so that there shall not be any kings like unto thee all thy days. And if thou wilt walk in my ways, to keep my statutes and commandments, as thy father David did walk, then I will lengthen thy days. And Solomon awoke, and behold, it was a dream. And he came to Jerusalem and stood before the ark of the covenant of the Lord and offered burnt offerings and offered peace offerings and made a feast to all his servants. Now, what did Solomon ask for from God? This is an important passage that you need to go back and read all of. But when Solomon takes over the kingdom after his father David, God comes to him in a dream and says, you can ask anything you want. And Solomon asked for an understanding heart to discern judgment, meaning I need wisdom. I need wisdom to actually steward what you gave me. That's what Solomon asked for, an understanding heart to judge the people. Now, why did it please God? Because Solomon was more concerned with stewarding the gift God gave him, the nation of Israel. He was more focused on that. He didn't ask for long life. He didn't ask for riches. He didn't ask for the life of his enemies, meaning God would kill him. Now, what three blessings did God give Solomon on top of the wisdom? Riches, honor. Now, honor brings peace, so that way you don't actually need the life of your enemies. And if you would walk in the statues, you would get length of days. So the three things that God was, ha with, God was pleased because Solomon didn't ask for money, long life, or the life of his enemies. And instead, because he didn't ask for that, God also, on top of the wisdom, gave him riches, peace, and gave him long life if he would walk in his commandments. Now, this is important because we're going to see this principle where it talks about, maybe it's, I think it's in the additional resources, but it says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. This is a principle we learned from Solomon, that if we would just focus on doing the will of God and doing what God needs done, then God will bring all of these other things into our life. What does this teach us about our heart position towards God? Focus on the Father, and His will is pleasing to Him. It pleases God when we focus on what God wants done. When we seek Him first, the rest will be added unto us. That's a part of our additional resources. I love this. As I'm teaching, I'm just... 
I'm, I'm teaching as I would normally teach it and I'm looking at all my notes as I go realizing this these things are in the additional resources just beautiful how God does things let's keep going I, I want to make sure we have enough time to hit some of these additional resources because I got a few of them that I really want to share with you and God said let the earth bring forth grass and the herb yielding seed and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind whose seed is in itself upon the earth and it was so and the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after his kind and the uh, and the tree yielding fruit whose seed was in itself after his kind and God saw that it was good this is in Genesis 1 I, I want to outline a principle that we're going to go through in the next couple passages as we go to finish on seed time and harvest or what we call sowing and reaping because sowing and reaping is a big one because in the Bible we talk about giving and we also talk about sowing and we use those words interchangeably and here's what I want to tell you today before even going into it you give that's a heart position my heart position is to give because I trust God with my finances but in giving I am actually operating in a kingdom principle of sowing and reaping so sowing and reaping and giving is the same thing but the position of your heart that I want you to take is giving I am giving because I trust God that God I trust you with my finances so I give now when I'm giving I'm actually sowing it into the ground now this is important because you might say, well, why, why is this important? It's important to have a heart position of giving, even though you are sowing and reaping, because it relieves, if all I think about when I think about giving is sowing and reaping, then I'm only really thinking about myself. You know, it's, I sow and reap for me, but if I give, I give for you. Now, even though that giving is technically sowing and reaping, I want to make sure that I never lose focus of the other person. This is the this is the part that most people get tripped up in when they get into thinking about finances, is they make it all about themselves. Or the church becomes so much about what can I get from God that it never is about what I can do for God. I give because I want to take care of others. Now, will it be given back unto me? Absolutely. But I'm not looking at the coming back to me I'm looking at what I can do for others. I hope that blessed you. I, I can't go into it anymore right this second. We just got to keep going. But let's answer these questions. What law did God put in place? The seed is in itself. Everything bears after its own kind. This is the spiritual law. The seed is in itself. So when we say we sow financially, that bears after itself. So if you put in financially, you get out financially. There's this whole thing where it says you got to name your seed. You know, if I give money, then I call forth apples. No, if you want an apple, you got to go plant an apple seed so you can get an apple tree. The seed is in itself. If you want healing, you got to go and sow healing. Go pray for people to be healed, to reap healing. You know, you got to sow and reap after its own kind. While the earth remaineth. Seed time and harvest, and cold and heat, summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. This is Genesis 8.22. Now, this principle, this law, is what's called seed time and harvest. There is a time for sowing, and there is a time for reaping. There is seed time, and there is harvest. But this is a law God created in Genesis 8. Listen, it says, while the earth remaineth. So as long as the earth is still around, which obviously it is because we're still here, then seed time and harvest is still in place. You can still operate in this law as long as the earth is still around. This is the way God intended it. This is the way God made it. Remember, God cannot break his own laws. So when he created seed time and harvest, he created it in a way that man has to cooperate with it. This law of seed time and harvest is as immutable as the law of gravity. If you go up on a building and you jump off the building, you are going to hit the ground. That's how it works. It's called gravity. And so seed time and harvest is the same way. As, 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 as foundational as gravity is in your life, seed time and harvest should be the same way. And understanding that what you plant, you also reap. 
Next verse. Let's keep going. We're going we're gonna to speed up just a little bit. The sower soweth the word. And these are they which are sown on good ground, such as hear the word, receive it, and bring forth fruit, some thirty, some sixty, some a hundredfold. What law is explained here by Jesus? Sowing and reaping. So sowing and reaping, seed time harvest, all of these things are the exact same thing. Why is it important to know these laws? If you don't know them, how can you operate them? So like, if you don't know that there is a thing called seed time harvest, you're just sitting around waiting on God to supernaturally put it in your hand. Listen, if you, I, I remember I heard, I think it was Caps, Charles Caps used to say it. He used to say, you can get all your seed. And he said, if you put it in the barn, and you can sit there and look at your field and you can say, oh God, I believe it's going to grow. But you never take the seed and put it in the ground. It's never going to grow. You have to take the seed and put it in the ground. And if you don't know that, you can't operate in it. And this is the same thing with your finances. This is why this is a part of your kingdom finance lesson. We're, I got some additional verses we're going to do in a minute that are going to help explain this even more. But if you don't take money as a seed and plant it in the ground give it into the kingdom you will never have it brought in a harvest you can't harvest anything if it's not sown so you have to sow to reap i also want you to know this works whether you like it or not this is this is just the truth because it is a law anybody can operate this law let me go ahead and say this even even non-believers, people who are not even believers, can operate in this law, because it's a law. It's not it's not a promise to believers. It's a law in the earth. This is the reason in which people. Well, let's read the next verse, and then I'll say this. And he said, "So is the kingdom of God, as if a man should cast seed in the ground." How does this translate? Sowing and reaping is a spiritual law. So is the kingdom of God. This is a law. Let me say this. There is a lot of people that ask me all the time, how does this person have so much money? How is this person so wealthy? Why does it seem like this person is so blessed? And they call out somebody who has a lot of money. The answer is super simple. Now, people really don't like the answer, but it is very simple because they give. If you are not a giver, you are not a receiver. You are not a reaper if you are not a sower. The thing that I see more often than not is there is a lot of people that aren't even believers that give more money away than believers do. Believers get into this mindset of, I'm going to give 10% and that's it. That's all I have to give. And that's the position they take on their heart. You can take that. And we're going to read in a minute, if you sow sparingly, you reap sparingly, then you know it is what it is. You, you reap based off your sowing. But I know a lot of people... Millionaires, you know how much money they give away? 50, 60, 70 percent. They give as much as they can. When they didn't have a lot, they still gave. I like to just say that whether you like it or not, it works. And I want to tell you this you are never responsible for ever talking about somebody else's reaping because you don't know what they sowed. I know there's a lot of big ministries out there, you know, people like Joe Olstein, Kenneth Copeland, Andrew Walmack. I'll tell you personally, I love these men. I think they're great men. I, I, I know people that have come out from their churches. I've heard them live. I've been in their services. These people are great men of God. Very wealthy. They have tons of money coming in. But I remember Dr. Summerall said one time, the richest man, the, 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 not the richest man, the most generous man he ever met in his whole life, gave more money away than anybody else he knew, was Kenneth Copeland. And most people hate Kenneth Copeland because they think, oh, that man has so much money. That man gives more money away than any of you. So let me tell you today, you can never judge a man's harvest if you aren't the one sowing. Which means when you become prosperous, nobody has a right to say anything to you about what you have because they never saw when you were giving. Let's keep going. And Jesus answering saith unto them, Have faith in God. For verily I say unto you, That whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea, And shall not doubt in his heart, But shall believe 
that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Therefore I say unto you, whatsoever things you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you shall have them. What spiritual law did Jesus explain here? Speak to the mountain. We've talked about this verse in previous lessons, so we're not going to go all the way through it. Believe what you say and pray that you receive them. Doubt not in your heart. You can have whatever you say or desire in prayer. This is important. I don't know if we're going to get to it today. I'll try to get to it. But this says whatever you desire, not whatever you need. Because what you need, God already knows. I'll put that in the additional resources. God knows your needs. Jesus said, before you pray, we'll get to it. Let, let's, let's keep going, and I'll, I'll, I'll flip to that additional resource in a second. We've got so much to go through today. Let's keep going. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace. To the end, the promise might be sure to all the seed. Not to that only which is of the law, but to that which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us, of us all. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations. Before him whom he believed, even God, who quickened the dead, and calleth those things which be not as though they were. What spiritual law is explained by Paul? Calling the things which be not as though they were. How do you receive a promise of God? Speak whatever you want to happen, and stand in belief without doubting in your heart. These two principles, speak to the mountain. Whatsoever things you desire, pray, and then call those things which be not as though they were. Those are two fundamental principles of speaking in faith, what we've already talked about before, but those two are incredibly important when it comes to your finances. Because you need to speak what you want to happen, and you need to call it even if it's not, which means you need to say, I am blessed, I am prosperous. All grace abounds unto me. All spiritual blessings in heavenly places. All these things are manifest. You need to speak like that in your life. Because that's how the grace of God or the blessings, the rewards of heaven come into your life. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. What is faith? Faith is a vessel that brings forth the manifestation of the promises of God. What is a profession of faith? Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and hath professed a good profession before many witnesses. Which means what you say, what you say is important. All of these principles apply to kingdom finance. Please don't make, please don't get off and thinking, what are we talking about today? We're talking about the fact God already blessed us. How do we work? We work as God is our boss. We have to sow and reap, and we have to speak in faith. All of these things are important and connected to our life. This is all dealing with finances, the kingdom way, God's way. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like the wave of sea driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. How do you receive? Stand in faith, waver not. This is a part of the progression of faith. We're not going to go through it all the way today, but remember... If all the things of God have already been given, we have to do it in faith to receive. Not to get God to give, but to receive. we got to receive these things from God. And it shall come to pass that thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe and to do all his commandments which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth. And all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee, Thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. What do we learn about the blessings of God? The blessings overtake thee. You chase God, and the blessings will come on you. Stay, should there be any worry when it comes to finances? If you are following God, then the answer is no. The financial provision will always be where God has told you to be. 1 Kings 17, 3, 4. Get thee hence, turn thee eastward, hide thyself by the brook chariot that is before Jordan. It shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook. I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. The provision of God is where God has told you to be. Now listen, that's the lesson. But we still got some time because I want to go through these additional resources. Let me read this verse to you. I just want to read some promises to you. And then I want to, and I want to outline some things and then we're going to summarize this. Thou shalt not be ashamed in the evil time. And in the days of famine, thou shalt be satisfied. Thou shalt be satisfied. 
Let me... Let's let's do this. Let's go to let's go to Luke. Let's read some promises. Man, there's there's so many different passages you can read on when it comes to kingdom finance. So let me read a couple of them real fast, and then I'm gonna summarize this whole thing. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure you meet, for with the same measure that you meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. So give and it shall be given unto you. Go to Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. It's that principle, sowing and reaping. For he that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. He that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap everlasting life. Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. And as we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially to unto them that are of the household of faith. Go to 2 Corinthians. I'm blasting through these because I want to take some time on one of these passages in particular. But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. He which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth the cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. As it is written, he hath dispersed abroad, he hath given to the poor, his righteousness remaineth forever. Now he that ministereth seed to the sower, both ministereth bread for your food, and multiply your seed sown, and increase the Increase the fruits of your righteousness, being enriched in everything to all bountifulness, which causeth through us thanksgiving to God. Let us... Okay, well, we're going to go to Malachi, and then we're going to go to Philippians, and we're going to finish in Philippians. But I want to go to Malachi real fast. I want to read a couple of last promises here, and then I'm going to explain all of it together. Oh man, this is so powerful. I wish we had more time to do this, but let's read this. Even from the days of your fathers, you are not gone away from my ordinances, and have not kept them. Return unto me, and I will return unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. But ye said, Wherein shall we return? Will a man rob God? If ye have robbed me, but ye say, Wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes in the storehouse, that there may be Meet in mine house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open up to you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be enough room to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. And all nations shall call you blessed, for you a delightsome land, saith the Lord of hosts. Go to Philippians 4. I'm just reading all of these. I'm, I haven't explained it yet. I'm going to read this, and then we're going to put all of it together. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and mind through Jesus Christ, or Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of a good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me, do, and the God of peace shall be with you. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at your last care of me hath flourished again, Wherein you were also careful, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am that therewith to be content. Now I know both how to be a base and how to abound. Where everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. 
notwithstanding ye have well done, that ye did communicate with my affliction. Now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. For even in Thessalonica ye sent once and again unto my necessity, not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. But I have all and abound. I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well pleasing to God. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Now unto God and our Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Let me talk about this. Let me talk about all of these things for just a second as we go to close because there's so many things we could talk about. The Bible is clear on a few things. There is a principle, a law, called seed time and harvest across the entire Old and New Testament. God implemented it in the very beginning. He also said that the seed is in itself, so what you sow is what you reap. Let me say this. If somebody says, if you sow financially, you'll reap healing, it's wrong. If you sow financially, you reap financially. If you sow healing, you reap healing. That's just a sacred cow I wanted to break real quick without going into it fully. If you are in lack financially, it's because you're not sowing financially. But also, there could be this aspect, and, and I, I really don't have time to go into it today. I really want you to go and watch our End Times Curriculum, Church of Sardis. Go watch the Church of Sardis, because I go into this more fully. But there is an aspect where, for a season, it could look like you are in lack, where you are suffering need where you don't have that financial but that's not because you aren't sowing that's because of persecution you're still giving into the kingdom but you might be suffering persecution that's an exception that not even an exception that's just a different thing so you facing persecution and facing lack because you're let's say you do this let's say you're at your job and you are serving as unto god you show up early, you, maybe you stay late, or you just, you know, you do everything you're supposed to, you work all day, you know, you don't give anybody any attitude, you come in in a good mood, you pray for people, you do everything you're supposed to do God's way. And maybe you're being held back because you're a boss. That's what's called persecution. But if you keep doing it God's way, God will promote you. You just can't get offended at the persecution. That's, that's what I meant by that. I hope that made sense. If you have questions, just please reach out. But all through the Bible, God gives a way for you to be prosperous. And that way for you to be prosperous, to walk in prosperity, is to operate in his law of sowing and reaping. But in the aspect of sowing and reaping, we have the heart position of giving into the kingdom. Meaning that what I do is for the advancement of the gospel of the kingdom. I'm not looking at me. I'm looking at you. I'm looking at the benefit of you. That's why it's considered a give. Now, because it's that way, I know it's still going to come back unto me. Okay? There's a law in place where it will multiply back. But you have to give it. You have to sow it. And as a believer, you need to have the position of, I'm doing it for the advancement of the gospel. I'm doing it because I want the gospel to go forth, for the benefit of others. Now, I always like to say this. Paul said, right here in Philippians 4, not because I desire a gift. And I'm telling you this today, as we go through this entire lesson on finance, the thing I want you to know is I'm not telling you this for me. I'm not telling you so you'll give more money to the church. That's not why I'm telling you this. You know, God supplies my need whether you give or don't. Listen, I, I ran out of money over 10 months ago and I'm still here. God supernaturally takes care of me every single month. It's not like he won't. God always takes care of me. So whether you give or not does not affect whether I am sustained by God. But the way you are taken care of, the way you receive from God is directly related to your sowing. I sow so I reap. If you don't sow, you don't reap. So you need to be giving. But I do want to make one point here. Philippians is very crucial in explaining this idea of partnership. Paul said, No church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. Because there was this aspect of we are in partnership. 
You took care of me even when I wasn't with you because we're partners, because you participate in giving and receiving. Because I give unto you spiritual things, I teach you the word, and you sow unto me carnal things financially. And this back and forth dynamic, we're partnered together. And you partner with me not only when I'm with you, but even when I leave you to do it for others, you're still partnered with me because the advancement of the gospel is going forth. So there's a principle I don't want you to miss here. And it's this principle of you sow where you are fed. There are so many people that when you see something on TV that moves your heartstrings, or some missionary comes into your church and pulls on your heartstrings, or whatever it may be. Now, I, I believe in supporting missions. I, I, I believe the church has a role in doing that. But as a believer, what your role in life is, is to give where you are fed. So wherever you are receiving learning from the Word of God, that is where you're supposed to give. Now, that may be your local church. That's that's maybe that's you go every Sunday, you learn the word, you're getting fed, you should sow there. I always tell people if you are getting fed at Blank Slate Ministries, to sow at Blank Slate Ministries, because that's what God says. God says you sow where you're fed. Listen, I sow where I'm fed. The ministries that I learn under and the ministries that I maybe I watch a teaching through Andrew Walmack, and, and it reveals something unto me, or maybe the Spirit of God speaks to me while I'm listening to him, I sow a seed. I sow because I got fed there. I never eat off of somebody's table without sowing seed. These are, these are principles of God that you must hold on to and you must cooperate with. Because remember, if you're not doing what God said, it's not faith. The only way to truly operate in faith is to do it God's way. So when we do these things, we want to do them in faith, so we do them God's way. So let me say this again. Galatians says, "What you know, God will not be mocked. Whatever you sow, you reap. Sow financially, reap financially. Luke, given, it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. I'm not going to go there, but Matthew 6 says that God already knows what you need before you ask. So you don't have to ask God for those needs. God already knows you need it. God wants to supply it. God has already supplied it. God has supplied it. God wants you to receive it. But the way you receive these things of God is by participating in the way God does it. Now I'm going to make one more point, and then we're going to finish. We didn't read it, and I have some daily teachings on this if you want to go and watch them. Just reach out to us if you want more information. But the book of Malachi talks about tithing. And don't, uh, don't walk around telling people that tithing's of the law, otherwise they'll realize how stupid you are. Tithing is not a law. It was incorporated into the law, but it was before the law. Tithing was a promised covenant of God, which means God's saying, if you'll do this, I'll take care of you. It wasn't demanded. It was a promise. So anytime you talk about tithing, Remember, tithing is not a law, it's a covenant. It's God honoring his position that God said, you will take care of me. You'll take care of me, I'll do my part, I'll give, and you have to take care of me. That's a covenant. I do my part, you do your part. Now, God is not responsible if you don't do yours. So if you don't give, God is not responsible for multiplying anything back unto you because you didn't put it in the ground to be multiplied. But this is the point I want to make. I want you to go and read Malachi 3. I want you to go read all of it. Because if you actually read the first, uh, I think it's eight verses or something like that, seven or eight verses in Malachi 3, Malachi 3 is actually referring to the refiner's fire. And it's the refiner's fire that leads into giving. You might say, well, why is that important? The more you grow up in God, and the more you have your life look like Christ because you've decided to grow up and mature and learn the Word of God, the more you will give. That's natural. The more you grow up in God, the more you give. A lot of times, the newest believers are the people who struggle the most with giving because they don't know what God says. The more you are refined, the more you learn about God's word, the more you want to give. Because you know if you give, you get more back. 
I'm not doing it because of that, but I know I'm going to get it back. I don't, I don't hesitate about giving. Church, I've, I've been dead broke. God given me a bunch of money and I give half of it away. I don't give half of it away because I don't trust God. No, I give half of it away because I do trust that God will supply. I, I trust God in my finances. And this is what kingdom finance is all about. It's not just giving money on Sunday. It's not just about sowing into blank slate ministries, you know, paying your tithes here, or giving offerings here, or whatever you may do. It's not about that. Kingdom finance is a lifestyle. It's not even just a lifestyle. It is your life as a believer, which is compromised of many different facets and many different truths. God has already given me everything I need. Uh, God already knew I God already knew I needed it and supplied it beforehand, so I don't have to talk to him about my needs. I just have to tell God what I want. Um, I know that my promotion comes from God, so I don't work as other people are my boss. I pay my taxes because it honors God. I I put my focus on doing the will of God, and because I focus on doing the will of God, all the other things come into my life because God will sustain me, because in him taking care of me. He receives glory. It brings thanksgiving to God when, when, when you are prosperous. I know that there's a principle in a law called seed time harvest. So because there's a law in place, I cooperate with it. I sow seed so God brings increase. And I know that I always speak in faith. I am prosperous. I am blessed. I thank God that I am uh, my seed is multiplied at a hundredfold, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, men giving into my bosom. The windows of heaven are open. The devil is rebuked. He will not touch my harvest. Like all of these promises. That's the last truth I want to tell you. Tithing, when you think of it as a law, most people don't do it. But when you think of it as a covenant, one of my favorite promises about the covenants of God when it comes to living out of kingdom finance and sowing and reaping and giving and it shall be given unto you and all these truths, is it says, I will rebuke the devourer from off your harvest. It's in Malachi chapter three. It's one of the greatest promises. you, I know people all the time, I'm just fighting the devil. I'm just trying to get him away so I can finally get prosperous. Listen, if you give money, and you sow seed into the kingdom of God. And if you give this money where you are receiving the, the, the teaching of the word of God and where you're being fed. And if you give bountifully so it comes back bountifully and you do all these things God's way. And you speak in faith and you serve as unto God and you do these things. Listen, God says you don't have to try to fight the devil. So that you stay prosperous. God says, I will stand and fight the devil on your behalf. I will rebuke him. And listen, if God rebukes the devourer, it won't be touched. You will receive prosperity in your life. But you have to do these things God's way. Now we're going to finish here for today. If you have questions, please reach out to us. I know that's a, a lot of truths. But remember, it's not about just giving. It's about a lifestyle. Knowing that God supplied, speaking in faith, serving as unto God, focusing on doing the will of God. All of these things go together. And this is what makes up kingdom finance or finances done God's way. So we're out of time. We're going to finish here. Father, I thank you. Bless everybody under the sound of my voice. I give you glory in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Church, I love you. Have a great day. We'll see you tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. for our daily teaching, and we'll see you next Monday at 7 p.m. for our lesson topic number 17. God bless you. Have a great day, and we'll see you tomorrow.